Welcome back to RNN's continuing coverage of the impeachment trial of President Donald Trump. You're looking now at the hallways just outside the Senate chamber, which just a few minutes ago were filled with members of the Senate walking away from their caucus meetings and heading back towards the chamber, though not every member is in. We are awaiting them to resume the session so we can get some sense, fingers crossed, of what the process is going to be from here on out, because the rules that they established at the beginning of this trial, they're now out of that window, and they're sort of making up the rules as they go along. We have had a vote just about an hour ago uh, for them not to include witnesses in this trial. At some point, they will move towards votes on the actual articles of impeachment, though that may not happen today. That's what everybody is trying to find out and why we're waiting for that schedule to be clarified. We can tell you that we've had a response from President Trump in his favorite medium, Twitter. And gentlemen, I'm going to ask for your help in deciphering this one because the president has tweeted, Democrats equal 17 witnesses, Republicans equal zero witnesses. I'm joined by uh, Rick Unger, who is the host of the Rick Unger uh, syndicated radio show and former federal prosecutor Roland Riappel. Roland, I wouldn't be holding that tweet up as an example of justice done. I'm not sure what to make out of that tweet, and I'm sorry to put you in the position of asking you, but what are you making out of that tweet? Well, I, what I would <laughs> do is uh, take that to the uh, election in November uh, and use that to bludgeon uh, the Republicans running for Senate in November uh, and say, you know, these are people who didn't want to hear the truth, didn't want to know the truth, and won't speak the truth if you send them to Washington. So uh, I think uh, this kind of tweet can be turned back on Mr. Trump and the Republican Party pretty effectively, uh, and I w that's what I would do with it. This is going to absolutely shock you, but Donald Trump is lying in that tweet. What? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I know. It never happens. Here's what he's trying to say. He's saying in the House of Representatives, the Democrats called 17 witnesses. The problem with the tweet is, guess what? The Republicans did call some witnesses. Yeah, and Jonathan so he's Turley. Saying zero. He, <laughs> yes. He's trying to pick up on what Jay Sekulow's close was today, where he was trying to make this point that, hey, we don't need more witnesses because the Democrats have already called 17 witnesses. If you're saying he's bad at tweeting, you're leaving him with no mediums that he's <laughs> particularly well, accurate he's on. He's apparently good at tweeting. If you <laughs> like what he writes, I, I, it's Friday night. I don't watch <laughs> Trump tweets on the weekend. You're just seeing uh, Mitt Romney in the hallways outside the Senate chamber. He was one of the two Republicans who voted yes for witnesses. He was joined by Susan Collins of Maine. The final vote, though, was 51 to 49. One more yes vote from a Republican, and it would have been a tie. And there could have been some issues as to whether the Chief Justice was going to break that tie. But we started talking about politics and the impact of this on the election. This is one of the areas that I think is of great focus. And, and Rick, I don't know, the, the, the closest analog to this that we've had in the Trump era thus far was the Kavanaugh vote, yeah. for Kavanaugh's uh, vote to the Supreme Court. And it seemed like it motivated Republicans to get out to the ballot in the midterms. Seemed like it motivated more Democrats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, does this play, to, will we be feeling the echoes of impeachment this November at the ballot? It's hard to say. It really is. Uh, I am somebody who tends to believe the way things work these days, everybody forgets everything within three days. And I wouldn't be surprised if they forget about this in three days. Trump will do something. I don't think anybody here would disagree. That's going to take our attention, take the media's attention. And by the time we get to November, who knows? I do agree that Kavanaugh did, absolutely did drive the midterm elections. I don't know if impeachment, it's a very different scenario. It's a very different scenario. And by the way, I would tell you that, that I understood Republicans turning out in bigger numbers, although obviously not big enough in the midterms, because I could see how the Kavanaugh hearings would have been very distasteful to them. But this is one of those things where, Roland, I'm reminded that it doesn't end when the trial ends, because John Bolton's book will come out at some point. Don McGahn may be compelled to testify before the House. There will be other drips of information that come out through the whole thing. Lev Parnas seems to have something to tell us every, every day. day. How could I have forgotten about Lev Parnas? <laughs> who's got a That's picture, what we're here who's for, Who's got Andrew. pictures with every Republican and yeah. every member of the Trump administration. And, and just wait for that judge to give him permission and just say, ah, go ahead, man, <laughs> put it all out there. It's all good. <laughs>
Uh, so this is the kind of thing where it doesn't go, like people get reminders and we might get more information sure. as to exactly what happened. Sure. I, and Trump's tax returns, those, mm. are, those are in the on deck circle. There's just so much more information that I think will dribble out in the next 10 months. It'll all be interesting to see. And that's just the presidential race. And we, by the way, the first votes in the presidential race come Monday with the yes. Iowa caucuses. There, right? But as we see Mitch McConnell re-entering the Senate chamber, there's a bunch of senators who may have done themselves some electoral harm in some of the votes that they cast today. Now, Susan Collins is up for re-election. She voted yes on witnesses. But Cory Gardner in Colorado, Joni Ernst in Iowa, Tom Tillis in North Carolina. Uh, I know there are others that I'm forgetting. But is the Senate more in play than perhaps we thought? And keep, keep in mind, Doug Jones in Alabama may be a dead man walking. Yeah, he already is. You know, in the case of Ernst uh, and, and Tillis, I think they're in a safer position than people want to say. What I find interesting is Car Cory Gardner, who I think probably had the most to lose. And I would be willing to bet you dollars to donuts that should he lose, there's a nice job waiting for him in the White House. We have, we have some poll numbers from each of these individual states where we had uh, what we're calling swing state Republicans who were on the ballot this year. The numbers are not particularly good for any of them as we're scrolling through. For example, half of voters in Arizona supported uh, impeachment and removal of the president. Martha McSally's approval rating to 37%. She's losing by three in the polls to Mark Kelly. And we'll scroll through some, some more of these. Uh, Roland, this will... You can see ads coming between now and November reminding people, hey, you know, this, this is how many people wanted to hear from witnesses and you voted no. Sure, sure. And it's all going to be about turnout. And this may well spur turnout if it's properly packaged and presented to the voters. Remember, there are more Democrats than there are Republicans. And it's just a question of getting them to turn out. Um, and particularly if those Democrats who don't often vote, young people and, and those types uh, turn out at the polls, we'll have some kind of landslide, maybe more ha seats in the House, uh, maybe a, Republic a, a Democratic majority in the Senate. Um, and I think you can drive turnout with these kinds of advertisements. And, and Rick, we also have the presidential race at the top right. of the ticket. So, you know, turnout will be big in Iowa. This isn't going to be a midterm election. It's, it's going to be big in Colorado. I mean, everything, not just big. It is everything. Uh, it always is. There's nothing new in that. This year, it's, you know, again, depending on what side you're on, if you're supporting the Republican candidate, you're wishing people will stay home. Um, but it's going to be very big. I agree with Roland's analysis. It's going to be very big. Toward that end, does the process matter? Will, will The result is one thing. The president was not convicted. He was not removed from office. Do you think voters are going to hold it against these, these senators? You didn't vote for witnesses. You didn't vote for the evidence. You rushed to a conclusion and a sense that justice wasn't done. Really depends who they're running against. You know, it's really hard to do analysis on this until you look at who they are opposing, what they're all about. Look, you know, you talk about Arizona. The problem that McSally has there isn't that she's so deeply hated, it's that Mark Kelly is a really attractive candidate. Yeah. And that's really what's beating her, much more than anything else. And the president may be a negative for her. I mean, it'll be, he'll, be a, he'll be a positive Could when be. it comes to the Republicans, but he may be inspiring Democratic turnout as well throughout all of this. Uh, as we take a look at the poll numbers and we wait for the Senate to get back into session, let's do a little polling of our own. And for that, we'll head back to the phones. Uh, we'll put the number back up on the screen uh, so that you can participate in the conversation. It's 888-766-2428. Also known as 888 RNN Chat. Uh, there are reports that we're going to have uh, the final vote on Wednesday, as the, we've been reporting for the better part of this afternoon. Uh, and those were the indications before this session started. We have yet to hear that officially, though, from uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. We expect that that will be one of the first things that happens once the Senate resumes. But as we wait, let's go back to the phones. Joseph has been holding patiently in North Brunswick, New Jersey. 
Joseph, your thoughts on the witness vote on the trial so far and anything else? Hello, Joseph. All right, we lost Joseph. Nice talking with you, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> he, to be fair, Joseph was holding for a very, very long time. Uh, let's go next to Lillian, who is calling from Maryland. And Lillian, I, I can't identify the town that you're calling from, so start there and tell us where, it, where in the state it is and then your opinion. Lillian, go ahead. I, I've been listening to you all, and I'm glad you all aren't running for president. I can't understand. I'm 89 years old. I can't understand when Hitler uh, killed the Jews. Everybody thought that was so bad. They don't care that they're killing innocent little babies before they're born, and Donald Trump is standing up against this as much as he can. I think he's... Lillian, thank, thank you very much. We were focused on impeachment and the two articles of impeachment, uh, and we'll try to keep the conversation stemmed in that direction, if at all possible. Uh, but thank you for the call. Really appreciate it. Uh, Rick, how, how much of this was, is, is the, we talked about this a little bit earlier, the siloing uh, of the two parties, that, that we haven't, you know, everybody's in their team modes at this point. So Donald Trump, if you're on the Trump team, can't seem to do anything wrong. And if you're in the Democratic team, you can't seem to do anything right. Well, to somebody who's on the Trump team, yes. yes. I mean, this is just the world we are currently living in, in terms of our politics. I think it's a great, great, great shame. Um, boy, I mean, we got to get past it. I don't see it happening anytime soon. But people who disagree are going to have to, at some point, figure out, we got to talk to each other. Like, you know, just because you don't like somebody's point of view doesn't mean you can't have a rational conversation. Yeah. And just because you're on one side doesn't mean you have to agree with everything on your side. My goodness. Uh, in my coverage days of the Obama administration, I was a big Obama fan, but I used to tick them off at least once a month because that was my job. We've got to have more of that on both sides. Yeah, I think the problem, and, and, and Rick is right, we have to learn to talk to each other but I think the problem was very well highlighted and explained in a piece I read by Ezra Klein recently about it. how the Democratic Party, because it's so broad and diverse, has to be sort of moderating itself at all times and everybody's yelling at each other and that kind of thing. The Republican Party has staked out a, a position of minority uh, a minority number of voters and and survives by revving them up with wild talk and 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 no compromise and indeed your last caller is an example of the type of person that the Republican Party um, speaks to and revs up and then vilifies the Democrats, where the Democrats are much less likely to take that position and behave in that way because they have to be more moderate to keep their coalition and, together. And by the way, that is the story that's going to start to, I agree with you and I agreed with Ezra, that's the story that's going to start to emerge. Not the tribalism between Democrats and Republicans, but what is in real danger of exploding in the Democratic Party. And I got to give Tom Perez some criticism here because you look at how he managed the convention and who he appointed to the chairmanship jobs. He completely forgot about the progressive wing of the party. And that is not going to help this problem. Yeah. Tom Perez, by the way, the uh, chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, and I think there's also a valid argument to me that Democrats may not have done an effective enough job yet at reaching out to those aggrieved voters, uh, some of whom I think Roland was referencing in some of the descriptions that he gave. There are some, whether right or wrong, whether you think it's founded or not, there are some voters out there who are afraid the country is changing in ways that they're not comfortable Absolutely with. Yeah. And the Democratic Party is seen as the agent of that change. Right. leaving a number of those people to wonder, well, what's my role in all of this? Right, and that, that is a problem. That is a problem. There are those alienated people in the Midwest who see manufacturing leaving the country. I don't really know what can realistically be done about that if people in Asia are willing to work for 
10 cents an hour to manufacture things, manufacturing is going to move there. That's just the fact. Um, and the people in the Midwest are understandably angry. They, for a hundred years, all they had to do was show up at the factory door and they had a job. And it's not like that anymore. Although I think back and Bill Clinton did a good job of, of showing an understanding or a sympathy for those disaffected right. voters in a way that I'm not sure the Democratic Party has done effectively yeah, since him. Even if he didn't necessarily <coughs> solve their right. problems, he, he felt at least their made pain. Them, yes. No, you're absolutely, I mean, this is, right. I criticize my own party a great deal, and this is at the very root of my criticisms. We did such a good job over the last generation taking on what you have to call special interests. There's special interests that we approved of. Right. If you wanted to, to create a scenario where same-sex people can get married, we did great, and I'm glad we did great. But you know what? Turns out we couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. We very much abandoned our real base, which is working class America. Let's yeah. go back to the phones as we await the resumption of the Senate trial and the Senate session. Let's go to Sabrina, who is calling us from, it looks like it's Linden, New Jersey. Hi, Sabrina. What's on your mind tonight? Okay, I do agree he should be impeached because, to tell you the truth, I've been watching him since he was on the campaign, Trump. And like I tell you, everything he touches, he destroys. He doesn't care about anybody else. He only cares for himself. And he, destroy, he destroys people's careers, you know? And most of the people are so ignorant. They can't, they can't see what's in front of them. And it's terrible. Sabrina, thank you very much for the call. Uh, very quickly, let, just bring me back if you can, guys. Uh, when we go to the phones and we know you're on hold, we're just asking you very... Uh, uh, hit the mute button on your phone uh, before we come and we take a call uh, so we don't get that noise in the background. It's less distracting for you. It's less distracting for us. Uh, having said that, we really appreciate the calls uh, that are coming through. Uh, I want to go to Alan, who is calling from Tinton Falls in New Jersey. Uh, Alan, uh, you have an interesting point to make about the Democrats and how they've handled the impeachment trial. Yeah, I don't think they did a uh, good job. In that. Like, uh, like Adam Schiff, uh, he keeps talking about the conspiracy theories, but the conspiracy theories, it's not a conspiracy if they're true, you know, because... The Republicans actually uh, called him out a bunch of times, and he doesn't even want to, uh, be, you know, answer the questions about the, uh, his contacts with the whistleblower and stuff like that. So, and so, well, Alan, thank you very much. Uh, he did answer it. He did directly. He he did, um, and he basically said that a lot of the, a lot of the claims that they were making weren't true, or that they're. At, at the heart of it is he doesn't know to this day who the whistleblower is. The whistleblower he never got his name, never met him. Somebody on his staff did meet him, which he has acknowledged. You know, this is the problem. I'm sure there are some good arguments that your caller could make where he could say that, that Schiff or anybody on the House management team didn't do a great job on an issue. But see, they go to something like that, and they're wrong. But, but he did... He, he, he was on the kernel, I thought, of a, of a point, which is where I was hoping he was going, because <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk to Roland about it. There was an argument that Democrats rushed the process in the House. Uh, I understand what the Democrats were saying, that we tried and they were basically running out the clock here by going to court and delaying everything and delaying everything, which, by the way, Donald Trump used to do in his business life all the time, right. which is where we've seen this playbook before. But... Did the Democrats do an incomplete job? Did they rush this process through? Is there room for criticism of the way they prosecuted this impeachment? Uh, I, I think perhaps there is. Um, perhaps they should have run to court and tried to enforce some subpoenas to force uh, witnesses to testify before returning articles of impeachment. But uh, I think they believed in good faith that the Senate would... Uh, do its job and uh, subpoena witnesses itself. And if the president thumbed his nose at the Senate in that circumstance, I think the Democrats hoped that that would turn a few senators in favor of uh, impeachment. So I, I, it's a very tough strategic call. Um, you know, I, I think it is fair to analogize the process in the House 
to the grand jury type proceeding. And as a prosecutor, I would tell the viewers that, you know, I had cases where I brought an indictment, which is the equivalent of the articles of impeachment, before every piece of evidence had been gathered because the person involved was a one-man crime wave. And you gotta get him charged and into court with the cuffs on and get bail set and all of that to try to put a stop to it as fast as possible. It doesn't mean that you can't go gather other evidence after he's been charged. Right. Um, and I think this was a situation where uh, Donald Trump was a one-man crime wave in terms of interfering in the election. You had to try to put a stop to it as quickly as possible. That's, that's the legal analysis, the political in all of this, because Nancy Pelosi got a ton of criticism after the House passed the Articles of Impeachment for sitting on it for the better part of a month. But in that time, we got Lev Parnas, we got the OMB decision that the president broke the law, we got um, some more, uh, Lev Parnas, oh, uh, John Bolton. John Bolton. John Bolton. Uh, I, almost, I almost buried the lead. <laughs> um, from a political standpoint, critique and grade the Democrats. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break all the rules of being a guest. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna answer your question with a question. Oh, okay. And that is, do you think it would have made any difference at all? Politically. Politically, politically, I actually think that Pelosi helped the Democrats so cause. Um, I don't think there was any chance that the president was ever gonna be convicted. I mean, unless they allowed witnesses and somebody had videotape of him ordering the thing in, happening. In fact, it would have made it better because you would have gotten that, if you could have gotten that testimony, you would have gotten it out of, way, out of the way, and by the time it got to where the focus was going, which was the Senate, there wouldn't even be this discussion. I think she actually was pretty clever in delaying the delivery, and I don't think it would have made one shred of difference. We continue to wait for the Senate to resume this session and resume the trial. They have just voted down witnesses. That was already about an hour and a half ago. Uh, and we are now waiting to see what happens next. Are they going to vote on the actual articles of impeachment? Are they going to set a schedule that will take that over the next couple of days? We will find out when you find out live on RNN as our coverage continues right after this. And as we wait for that, you see the phone number. We want you to call in and participate in the program.